Kia ora te iwi. In today's news, the government backs out of winter grazing rules. Farming advocates are still feeling unheard as they plan for another protest. And Greta Thunberg is championed by the wool industry. Welcome to the All Report Animal Rights News for Aotearoa New Zealand. The farming sector celebrates the government's decision to scrap winter grazing rules as new, more industry-friendly regulations are proposed. After years of delaying action on winter grazing, the government has once again caved into industry pressure. Previously proposed regulations set a 20 cm limit for how deep animals' legs can sink into the mud, and only in half of the paddock. The new rules will set absolutely no limits, asking farmers only to prevent it happening as far as practicable. The previously set time frame for replanting the land was also scrapped, with new rules again asking farmers to comply as soon as practicable. Environmentalists and animal advocates have condemned the announcement, with Greenpeace campaigner Christine Rose saying the government has listened to a minority group of vocal dairy lobbyists. The so-called Ministry for the Environment and Ministry for Primary Industries have once again proven themselves ineffective in the face of the most critical animal and environmental issues. The National Party has started a petition against new legislation aimed at ensuring safe drinking water, requesting an amendment which would exempt water schemes that supply fewer than 30 endpoint users, including, for example, farmers supplying drinking water to their neighbours and staff members living on site. The new legislation would force farmers to comply with new centralised drinking water standards to be overseen by the central government instead of their friendly local councillors. The bill would require drinking water suppliers to ensure their water is safe, a big issue for agricultural communities. National Party MP Christopher Luxon says this would inconvenience farmers. Look, that's nuts. There's going to be about 70,000 people caught up in rural farm schemes um, as a result. A, it's going to be a bureaucratic nightmare. B, there's a hell of a lot of stuff coming at farmers and you've just got to think through, you know, slope rules and freshwater regulations and labour workforce shortages, ute taxes, all the other stuff that's been going on. The government's just raining a hell of a lot of regulations down on these folks. But apparently the government isn't listening as Groundswell NZ continued their Can You Hear Us event during lockdown, asking supporters to honk their horns to get the government's attention. <laughs> Co-founder Bryce McKenzie reflected on the effectiveness of the event, saying, I'd say it's been reasonably lame. Groundswell's official message has been to abide by lockdown rules with protesters honking into the ether, but not everyone was on the same page. Agriculture Action Group apparently missed the memo, continuing to encourage people to protest without adjusting to lockdown recommendations. The COVID deniers among the group came out against Greymouth Mayor Tanya Gibson for simply wearing a face mask. In order to prevent a repeat of the shocking signs seen at the last protest, Groundswell traded points with their free speech advocates for more positive public relations, providing a specific list of pre-approved signs for their November protest. The event's exact date is yet to be announced, leaving animal rights advocates in suspense to see if this year's November 20th Animal Rights March will be free from double bookings, unlike last year's march which was crashed by a very welly Xmas due to a Wellington City Council era. The chance of African swine fever reaching our shores has increased after Germany, who supplies New Zealand with pig flesh, identified the virus in their supply chain. The virus poses a huge threat to the pig farming industry, which has previously led China, the world's largest supplier of pig flesh, to kill half of their pig population. News media focused on possible economic harm, forgetting to mention the virus causes severe suffering to those already tortured animals. Meanwhile, the New Zealand Pork Industry Board are asking for equal welfare standards to be applied for imported products, with 60% of pig flesh consumed in Aotearoa coming from overseas. Considering the majority of these sources have lower welfare standards than our own, this could see a drastic reduction of dead pigs in the local market, as well as a national price increase of available products. And another threat to animal agriculture as campaign efforts against blood phosphate from occupied Western Sahara continue. The phosphate is used to make fertilizer, without which it would be impossible to keep so many animals on farms.
Two weeks ago, the Rail and Maritime Transport Union protested a shipment of blood phosphate into Napier by providing the captain of the vessel a copy of a 2019 Council of Trade Unions resolution, condemning Morocco's illegal occupation of Western Sahara and calling upon the New Zealand government to halt importation of phosphates from the area. There are currently two petitions making the same request. Here's hoping the added pressure brings about a positive change for the indigenous Sahrawi people. Fertilizer companies also create dangerous chemical pollution and are usually placed in the midst of indigenous or otherwise marginalized communities. Local hapu or Farero Marai have spent years campaigning for cleaner air and the managed retreat of the Mount Monganui industrial area, the main culprit being fertilizer company Balance Agri Nutrients. Campaigners have asked for a generous 10-year phase-out period, but the government has repeatedly ignored their pleas, forcing them to seek the support of the United Nations. Our recommendations to the United Nations was for an immediate cessation of, of chemical violence upon our community, um, as well as the ongoing granting of consents um, and the giving of existing land use rights uh, to corporate industries, which is, is able to supersede the uh, existing land use rights of Mana Whenua who have been there might are not. Fonterra is attempting to squeeze further profits from Tangata Whenua as they apply for a trademark of Kupa Māori under the guise of Te Reo revitalization. This trademark includes words such as kōwhai and awa and would give Fonterra exclusive use of this kupu for naming dairy products. National Māori Authority Chairman Matthew Tukaki told Fonterra, spend your time cleaning up the waterways of your farms rather than trademarking the word awa, and says the trademark could hurt smaller Māori-owned businesses. We reached out to Tukaki, who clarified the trademark could also impact plant-based alternatives such as almond milk. Fonterra's application is currently in review and Tukaki says he's officially written to the Intellectual Property Office opposing all Fonterra applications to trademark any Te Reo Māori words. Tōtoko. Reefton farmers seeking to transition away from dairy farming have announced see you later from the hemp industry for the foreseeable future, stating they've been bullied by Medsafe. We got a letter threatening us with a fine of up to $100,000 and a loss of license for selling in unregistered medicine. Um, their words, not ours. Um, it was a blackmail tactic because um, we would love to have taken them to court, um, but we don't have the money to take on them government officials. A MedSafe spokesperson said therapeutic claims about the products were being made and that when a product is intended for therapeutic purposes, it falls within the scope of the Medicines Act. Sounds like Big Pharma is attempting to monopolize the benefits of hemp. Larry's Gold contested MedSafe's point but have bowed out due to the stress this process has caused their family. Kia kaha e tatariana mato ki te hokinga mai. Hey. Hi, hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm going good. <laughs> I was just wondering, we just need somewhere to crash for a couple of days. Oh, um, it's just that we can't really have a dog in the house. No, that's totally fine. Sorry. The first pet refuge in Aotearoa has opened in Tamaki Makoto, which aims to give domestic violence victims a safe place to take their animals while they focus on escaping abuse. We know um, in domestic violence situations that pets are often used as a means of control and women won't leave these situations because they fear for their pets' lives and their safety. The refuge is able to take a range of companions such as cats, dogs and guinea pigs as well as larger animals which will be taken to what they call safe farms. To contribute to the refuge, visit petrefuge.org.nz. The opposite of refuge, farms are dangerous places for animals, and not only because they're holding pens for slaughter. Often, their limited shelter makes them vulnerable to bad weather conditions and natural disasters, as seen recently with the unfortunate deaths of two baby cows in a Taranaki tornado. Farmed animals are also susceptible to abuse, which is repeatedly enabled by our legal system. A Taranaki farmer was discharged without conviction after MPI found 30 animals in his care in very poor condition. One horse, now deceased, had long-term painful lesions and eight cows were skeletally undergrown. The farmer, who gave no explanation for the cow's condition, was only ordered to pay vet and lab costs, which came out to a sad $4,500. 
Over in Canterbury, a young cow had to be lifted out with a crane after she fell and got stuck in a milking shed. This must have been a painful and terrifying ordeal for a cow trying to navigate the unnatural dairy complex, but that didn't stop the news media from blaming and making fun of her. One title read, Utter Chaos, a phrase surely coined with little thought to the cows enslaved for their reproductive abilities. The writer, Nadine Porter, said the cow decided she would rather be the centre of attention, as if a cow would choose anything from this wretched industry. In Lake Hawea Station, nine pregnant cows fell off a cliff after bikers spooked them on the dangerous stretch of Dingleburn Station Road. Six of them swam as far as several kilometres to get to safety, but sadly, three of them drowned. Whilst bikers were slammed for ignoring the signage, the situation also reminded us of how much of our beautiful land is privately owned in the hands of farmers. Meanwhile, a Waikato man reported a dog attack killing 11 animals, once again calling for a stronger response from animal control. The man showed us humanity's paradoxical relationship with animals, saying, The majority are pets, thanks to my three young kids, they name them, so if they end up with a name, they don't go in the freezer. He also warned, if I find the animals on our property harassing our stock, we do then have the right to extinguish them, making it clear that humans decide who lives, who dies, and how. And that happens to be Doc's exact approach when it comes to wild animals, as Marie Russell points out in this newsroom article. Last year, Doc reassured hunters that they won't try to eradicate all tars and will only kill female and young tars, leaving the older males for hunters to shoot and make themselves feel powerful. Killing animals is thus turned into a valuable currency for exchange, a dangerous perspective which feeds toxic masculinity and violence. And when they're not pandering to hunters, Doc is supporting the country's biggest polluters. Masterton Conservation Park declares war on rabbits after a $700,000 boost from the government. This is an unsurprising development after the anti-rabbit propaganda we've seen recently, including this government-funded six-part series from Newsroom called Apocalypse Down. They're living under houses, they're living under trailers, boats, water tanks. What the hell is going on there? There's no grass here, that's, that's just basically weeds. And, and, and that ground is, is basically buggered for any, any sort of farming. The main issue is summed up in Doc's website, which says, rabbits are regarded primarily as an agricultural pest. They compete very effectively with livestock for pasture. MPI states they cause a $50 million loss to the industry per year. Speaking of industries exposing themselves, the Meat Industry Association CEO, Sir Makarapiva, explained perfectly how sentient beings are different from other objects of mass production. She told Newstalk's Kate Hawksby that automation was not a solution to their labour shortages. Is Wellington bureaucracy just not understanding the industry? Is that part of the problem? Well, um, I, I suspect that they have quite a, um, a simplistic view of what happens. Perhaps it's influenced by what is um, quite commonly understood around manufacturing, is that you, you, know, you create something by putting together various bits. In our industry, though, we are in the disassembly industry. We take a whole product and we break it down into its constituent bits. And we are dealing with a natural product. We're dealing with, with animals all of which have natural variations. So the carcass that we have to deal with at the end of the day um, differs from, from one to the next. <sighs> After years of painting animals as mere products of consumption, the meat industry CEO seems surprised that people forget that flesh comes from living animals. More media fails as the New Zealand Herald makes a desperate attempt to demonise plant-based meat alternatives, as it pits the Beyond Burger against animal flesh patties. Without showing the actual figures, the writer said plant-based burgers often lack iron and B12, and that the Beyond Burger has less fibre compared to some plant-based patties. This is despite the Beyond Burger having higher iron and fibre than their chosen flesh burger, and comparable levels of B12. Their very own figures also showed that the Beyond Burger has less saturated fat, calories and sugar than the animal flesh counterpart. 
In animal welfare news, the Regulations Review Committee upheld a complaint by the New Zealand Animal Law Association against the Welfare Code for commercial slaughter of crustaceans. The complaint said that freezing crustaceans was outside the intention of the Animal Welfare Act as it causes them immense suffering. Of course, MPI disagreed and noted this is the only widely used method of rendering crustaceans insensible in New Zealand, and it is the most practical. The committee nonetheless found that the code was in breach of the Welfare Act and asked NAWAC to change the code so as to make it unlawful for crustaceans to be rendered insensible by freezing. Following up on the debate on equestrian sports at the Olympics, there are now numerous petitions seeking to end the cruel events, gaining from 20 to 40,000 signatures so far. This follows Annika Schlue's repeated abuse after her horse refused to participate. In response to the criticism, Annika Schlue says she was not aware of any cruelty to animals, which highlights the inherent cruelty involved in this blood sport. Climate activist Greta Thunberg was featured in Vogue as she highlighted the environmental harm caused by fast fashion. After the issue was released, it was discovered Greta, who is vegan, was in fact wearing a wool outfit for the shoot. This garnered praise from the wool industry who were quick to use Greta for wool propaganda. She also received widespread backlash from vegans on social media. However, animal rights group PETA have confirmed that Greta was unaware that the outfit she was photographed in was made of real animal wool. Greta continues her good work and we applaud her for calling out New Zealand for our agricultural emissions, which have reached an all-time high. No doubt to the ire of New Zealand's wool industry. In sports news, TJ Perenara has brought veganism back to the All Blacks. He was interviewed by Nick Mills from Newstalk ZB who asked him about his transition. You've gone vegan and uh, I just can't understand how it works. Tell, tell us, do you miss it? Me? Um, no, not now. This was met with mixed reviews as some felt personally threatened by TJ's compassionate choice. I guess the simplest uh, way to say it is carbon footprint, like the, the impact that agricultural fa farming has on um, the world's pollution. And I was like, man, how can I justify um, I care about it um, if I'm eating meat, effectively. Yeah. And then um, like animal cruelty was, a, was probably the second part of that for me. And more positive news, as new vegan eatery Bonobo has opened in the coastal Ototahi suburb Sumner. Their goal is to share their love of hosting others whilst raising funds to start a sanctuary for farmed animals. The cafe is co-owned by Annalise Baston, a proud vegan and activist who says the opening weeks have been a huge success, requiring them to seek out new members of staff to accommodate the demand. Bonobo uses mostly local and organic ingredients, with a house-made burger, crispy tofu bites, and a specialist selection of smoothies headlining their menu. More vegan food in Ototahi, as Dunedin's 100% vegan and gluten-free food truck Street Bowls has moved into the neighbourhood. Run by Daniel Morby, Street Bowls are available for private functions and catering. Their menu features an array of delicious wholesome eats, all served in home compostable bowls. Keep an eye out on their Facebook and Instagram pages to see where they'll be serving up after the lockdown. The prevalence of veganism in the region is clear as Burkano Foods, another Ototahi-based vegan company, have reached their minimum pledge me target of $30,000, which they say will assist them to move into a new facility and to branch out into a new range of vegan meat alternatives. The company has products stocked in supermarkets around the country and offers delivery through their website for a range of products, specializing in pre-prepared meals which they cook in their 100% vegan factory, free from any cross-contamination of animal products. Burkano say they're passionate about making vegan food more accessible, which is reflected in their website with value meals available as well as factory seconds at a discounted price. There must be something in the water down there. Maybe it's the nitrates. Think we've reached peak alternative milk innovation? Think again, as Hawke's Bay butternut squash farmer Shane Newman is utilizing the otherwise wasted seconds of his squash exports to be turned into kabucha milk, which is expected to do well within the Asian market, where they consider kabucha as a diet staple. Whilst all products will be exported, Newman say they're using local farmers, local R&D and local manufacturers, 
packaging and domestic logistic companies, so the benefits to New Zealand economy was considerable. The venture is a joint collaboration with celebrity chef Sachi Nomura and has received $95,000 through MPI's Sustainable Food and Fibre Futures Fund. Thank you for joining us. This has been the All Report. Kia homaru tenoho. Mate wai te week.